Let's sing together, church, and worship this light of the world. Your love so great, Jesus, in all things. I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years. Still I'll be singing. How can I praise you enough? How can I praise you enough? You are the Lord Almighty, outshining all the stars in glory. Your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else can be. calls all to the Savior. We are alive for your praise in earth and sky. No one is higher. Our God of wonders, you reign. Our God of wonders, you reign. You are the Lord Almighty shining all the stars in glory your love is like the wildest ocean oh nothing else compares not to us but to your name we lift up all praise not to us but to your name we lift up all praise not to us but to your name we lift up stars in glory your love is like the wildest ocean oh nothing else compares you are the lord almighty i'll shine in all the stars in glory your love is like the wildest ocean to your name we lift up all praise not to us but to your name we lift up all praise
to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come down. Let your glory reign, shine in strong to say in your mighty name King of heaven come Christ by highest heaven adored Christ the everlasting Lord made in time behold him come offspring of a virgin's womb Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to save. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. Hey everyone, James here. Uh, I'm the Youth and Young Adults Director here at New Life Church, and I'm here with you today to light the third Advent candle. And so if you want to get your Advent candles out and we'll light them together. And so the first Sunday of Advent, we celebrated the candle of hope. And that represents the hope that we experience in this Christmas season. The second Sunday, last Sunday, we celebrated the candle of joy which represents the joy that we feel during this, tr during this Christmas season. And the third candle we're going to talk about today is the candle of love. And so the candle of love can be de best described in some verses that I found in 1 John 4, verse 7 to 12. And these are some of my favorite verses, and I think they very well represent lo the good love that God has for us. So if you have your Bibles, let's... I'd encourage you to turn with me there. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that he, we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. What is this love that's being talked about? In a worldly sense, this love is nothing more than a few chemical reactions happening in your brain that produce a warm, fuzzy emotion. And so love in a worldly sense is nothing more than just a feeling that you feel. Kind of impersonal if you look at it like that. 
But luckily, we as Christians have a different kind of love that we feel. Uh, this love is more personal and more tangible. Uh, when I think of it, I think of a grandparent's love for their grandkids or a parent's love for their child. And this love is... This love can, can be shown as an action. It's more than just a feeling. It's an action. And God, during the Christmas season, took action to send his ultimate gift of love to us. And that is his son. God loved us so much that he sent us a gift of love, not because we loved him, but because he loved us that much. He loved us so much that he sent Jesus Christ to the earth to suffer and be humiliated and shamed and eventually hung on the cross for us. I think Billy Graham says it best when he says, God proved his love for us on the cross. When Christ hung and bled and died, it was God saying to the world, I love you. And so God showed us his love by sending Jesus to the cross. And so when we think of love in the Christmas sense, we can't help but think of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so this Christmas season, as we light the candle of love, I want you to be reminded of the love that God has for us and use that love not as, no, don't leave that love as a reaction, a chemical reaction in your brain, but take action this Christmas season and love those around you. Why don't you join us in singing this old hymn? Hey everybody, good morning and welcome to uh, our experience of worship together. 
Um, I just want to wish you a very happy Sunday on this Advent Sunday as we approach this Christmas season uh, with an attitude of worship and anticipation and celebration of uh, our Lord Jesus coming to, uh, to take on human flesh, to live a real human life, uh, to be with us in the trenches. And uh, as we move towards that, a few quick announcements. Tonight on this same YouTube channel at 6.30 p.m., we're going to be having our Christmas uh, carols event, which is uh, Carols by Candlelight. And uh, that's going to be just great. There's going to be special music. I'm going to be uh, reading a, a story that I've selected uh, that will, uh, I think, be very special, both for young and old alike. And then also we'll have uh, an opportunity for us to sing carols together uh, in that service. So do join us at 6.30 p.m. right here on this same channel. Uh, this upcoming Friday, we're going to be delivering our baskets for uh, the basket outreach. And uh, if you show up at the church at 6.30 p.m. Uh, ready to deliver the baskets, we will get those into your hands and get you some addresses and uh, you'll be able to uh, take those out and deliver those as a blessing to those in our community. And what a wonderful way just to show that uh, we as a church are thinking outside of these walls, outside of our own concerns and our own lives, especially during this time. What a wonderful way to uh, just bless others and to experience uh, the Lord Jesus spirit of giving together. Uh, our Christmas Eve service on December 24th will be premiering at uh, 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and 7 p.m. It'll be about a half an hour, and so we just invite you to join us for that as well. All of these things are just uh, our, uh, our ways, our opportunities of uh, continuing to experience worship uh, together. And you know what? We're not physically together right now, and I just encourage you that today on this Lord's Day, uh, above all other days, Days that uh, if there's somebody that comes to mind, um, that you would just reach out, that you would make a phone call and say a prayer with a fellow believer and just ask how they're doing and make that personal connection because we really just want to continue to be the church, not just be, be people watching screens, but also be the church together uh, through this day and through this Christmas season. So now we're going to bow our heads and we're going to pray uh, and ask God's blessing on our offerings and our tithes and and uh, after I say this prayer that uh, we've been saying together over these last number of weeks, uh, there'll be some instrumental music that will play and just allow you the opportunity uh, to go to the New Life Stonewall website and uh, make your contributions there. So let's bow our heads. Generous Father, every good gift I have is from you. You know my every want and every need and have promised that you will not withhold any good thing from those who pursue you. This fallen world calls me to self-centeredness, but your spirit calls me to selflessness, just as your son selflessly gave himself for me. So, as a faithful steward of all that you have given me, I delight in giving back to you. I desire to grow in generosity, using my gifts, time, and resources to build your kingdom. I desire to be trustworthy with these temporary things so that you will trust me with eternal riches. For your glory, I desire to be generous because you are generous. It is the delight and calling of your children to share your heart and to selflessly show what you are like to the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, hey there, everybody. So glad that you're joining us here this morning. For those of you that maybe found us online, my name is Rusty, one of the pastors here at New Life Church. So glad you're with us. Uh, here we are. <sighs> Another four weeks of lockdown, at least. My guess is you have never been at home as much as you have been these days. And you're probably using, like the Hildebrand family, some of this extra time to watch a few more Christmas movies than you would usually watch this time of year. So I'm just kind of wondering, what is your favorite Christmas movie? I just want to give you a minute. Just wherever you are right now, just shout it out. Shout out the name of your favorite Christmas movie, okay? Go. All right. Well, this is how this works. If, if right away you shouted out the nativity, well, that means that you're kind of that upper caliber, highly spiritual uber Christian. All right, good for you. Now, if you shouted out National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, well, there's a little bit of work to do in your life. Uh, the Hildebrand family earlier this week, we curled up on the couch and we watched The Grinch. That's one of our favorites. We especially like the, the animated, the recent animated uh, version. And you probably know the story of the Grinch, right? It begins uh, with this green character. He's miserable and grumpy, and he hates Christmas. And we find out at the beginning of the movie that, that he is this way because he was born with a heart two sizes too small. Now, the movie begins with him in his lair, finding he's out of food, and begrudgingly, he has to make a trip into Whoville at Christmas. Now, Whoville is a place full of joy, full of the spirit of Christmas. And so he makes this trip in to restock his shelves, and right away he's confronted with all these jolly who's, and, and especially a band of carolers. And these carolers are singing, God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray, O tidings of comfort and joy. O tidings of comfort and joy. And so they're singing these words as they're chasing the Grinch through town. And, and you could almost miss it, and I almost missed it. And then I thought, hold on here. What did they just say in this kids movie as they were just about to move on to a bunch of silly, humorous things? What did they just say? Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power? when we were gone astray. Did they really just say that? And, and, and did they just say it as if it was kind of nothing? It was just like telling the, 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 the weather report before you move on as if they hadn't said something that was hugely consequential and hugely controversial. I was just struck by that. You know, I, I think that we can sometimes hear a song so many times that we just don't hear it anymore. And we can hear a story so often that we just don't hear the story anymore. And, and I think that's especially true at Christmas with the Christmas story. I wonder if we've heard it so many times we just don't hear it anymore. Now, what do I mean by when I say the Christmas story? Now, I'm talking about those words that my dad read to myself and my siblings every Christmas Eve. Now, my Christmas Eves kind of all looked the same growing up. My dad was a pastor, and so after supper, we'd head to church where we'd have our candlelight service, and us kids were eager to get home because we had gifts waiting for us. But my dad being the pastor, now some of you can relate, I know Damaris can, uh, he had to be the last one out the door, right? He had to greet every last person, and we were hanging on my dad's leg going, Dad, we need to get home. And finally, he turned off the lights and locked the door, and, and we drove home, and we gathered around the tree, but, but before we could open those gifts, he had to read us the Christmas story. We knew we had to get through the first 20 verses of Luke, and so my dad would sit us all down. He would turn open his Bible to Luke chapter 2, and he'd read for us verses 1 to 20. You know the story. It begins with Caesar Augustus. Uh, declaring that there would be a census of the entire Roman world and, and this young couple, Mary and Joseph, heading off to this little town called Bethlehem where a baby was born to them and there were angels and they announced something to shepherds and the shepherds were full of joy and, and they left praising God. The end, that was the Christmas story. And, and who wouldn't love that story? It's got a baby in it. But that's not really the end of the story. And it wasn't even really the beginning of the story. That's just a part of the Christmas story. So this morning, we are beginning a three-week Christmas series where what we're gonna do together is we're just gonna kind of zoom out. 
we're gonna we're gonna we're kind of gonna zoom out high where we can see the whole Christmas story from beginning to end, and we're gonna. We're gonna look at the story from that vantage point in a series that we're calling the Extreme Christmas Makeover. Now you've heard that word, makeover. We hear it a lot. There's a lot of shows that are called makeover shows. What is a makeover? A makeover is like a transformation that something or someone undergoes that, that, that is so um, complete that the end product is almost unrecognizable compared to where uh, where they started and so we have a makeover of people the way they look with makeup and fashion and their body shape We have a makeup uh, a makeover of homes And so maybe you watch that wildly popular show extreme makeover home edition Where they take kind of a rundown home and a family facing hardship and a family that really has doesn't have the resources or the vision to be able to do anything to this place where they live and they send them away and then professionals come in, help from the outside and they come in and they totally make over this home and so it doesn't look anything like it did before. Makes for good TV. What we're gonna be doing here is looking at the extreme makeover Christmas edition because Christmas really is as we're going to see the most extreme makeover ever It it really is about God making over it's about God creating again And so our key verse through this series isn't in any of those traditional Christmas stories in the Gospels Actually, it's in the book of 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 and so these are a few verses that we're going to spend a few weeks in together. Verse 17 is kind of our key verse. It says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. So what that, what that verse says is that with Christ's coming, Something new has come. A new creation that Christmas is all about creation. What is this new creation that the coming of Jesus Christ brings? Well, uh, there in, in 2 Corinthians 5 in that verse, it literally says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. Literally in the Greek, that's what it says. New creation. And it kind of leaves you have to figure out what is this new creation that Jesus brings. But, but certainly it refers back to the anybody who is in Christ. Anybody who is in Christ, that person, that individual becomes a new creation. What is the new creation? You. If you are in Christ, you are the new creation. And we see this language used elsewhere in the New Testament by Paul a variety of times. In Ephesians chapter two, uh, verses 10, he says, for we are Christ's, or we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. Created in Christ Jesus. So in him, we become something that can only be described as new. New, and if there's a new, that means there is an old, and Paul said, the old has now passed away. So what is that old? To understand the old you, you have to really go back to the beginning of the story, and I, when I say the beginning of the story, I mean the real beginning. I mean all the way back to the, big, the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter one, and maybe you know how it goes, God creates and the pinnacle of his creation is mankind, man and woman, and we're told that God makes us in his image, which is to say that he makes us with this unique capacity and purpose of knowing him, having relationship and fellowship with God, and so we have a picture of, 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 of mankind um, in relationship with God. It talks about God walking with, with the man and the woman in the garden. And it's this picture of intimacy, of relationship, and not just uh, uh, intimacy with God, but intimacy with one another. We're told that the man and the woman that God has made, he says uh, that we need a companion, we need someone else, we need others. And the man and the woman were naked and they felt no shame. There was no barrier between them. They had a harmonious relationship. It's this picture of intimacy 
at the very beginning when God created. But then, maybe you know the story, something happens. They make a fateful decision. They turn away from God and they choose, they choose their own way. They choose, they choose not to trust in God, but to trust in their own wisdom. I, I, I guess maybe to, to break free from the supposed chains of the rule of God in their lives, but, but really all they found was that they broke themselves. And so right away we see this brokenness that is brought into their lives when they turn from God and follow their own way. We see the brokenness in their relationship with God. Right away, God comes looking for them and, and Adam and Eve, they hide in the garden. They hide from God. They are afraid of God. And this relationship is broken, this intimacy. We see a brokenness in, in their relationship with one another as people. Right away, they start blaming one another for their problems and now they recognize they are naked and they feel shame and they take fig leaves and they cover themselves up to hide themselves from one another, to protect themselves from others. And all of a sudden, there's this barrier in relationships that intimacy is broken in our relationship with one another. Now, that's an ancient story, but, but even as we, we hear it, we think of it, I, I think it rings true for us even today. I think we all feel this sense of, and have felt the sense of brokenness in a variety of ways. Even if we can't put it into words, we feel broken. We feel like there's gotta be more to life. There's gotta be more meaning than we experience. There's, there's got to be a way to, to be better. We, we have this desire, th th this belief that we're not all that we can be, that we ought to be. We disappoint ourselves. We carry guilt and we just don't know how to rid ourselves, to free ourselves of the guilt that we carry in our lives. We deal with anxieties and worries because when we look at the future, all we see is darkness. We see uncertainty. We don't know where things are going and we don't know why we're here. Truly, we have felt, and some of you will even feel today like you have gone astray, as in the words of those carols, of that carol. We feel lost, like we're living in a dilapidated house. And, and we're not sure what it could be, and, and, and we're not sure how we could ever make it better. We certainly don't have the resources to do it ourselves. No amount of self-help is gonna solve our problems. We need, we have this sense that we need help from the outside. But even as that first man and that first woman started to experience this brokenness in their life in a variety of ways, God spoke of something or someone that was to come. We find it there in Genesis chapter three, verse 15. In speaking to the serpent, God says, I'm gonna put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring and he, that is, an offspring of the woman, he will crush your head, Satan, and you will strike his heel. And right away, God speaks of this offspring of a woman who at some point will come, and when he comes, he's gonna crush the power of Satanists. Satan, he will reverse the curse. Now, they didn't know what that meant, what that could possibly look like. But many hundreds of years later, God kind of spoke of that again to the prophet Isaiah. You'll see the words on your screen, Isaiah 42, verses one to nine, where God says, he says, here is my servant who I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight, and I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations, and he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And in faithfulness he will bring forth justice and he will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth and in his teaching the islands will put their hope and God is speaking of the servant who will come. 
And when he comes, he's going to set all things right. And then in verse 9, God says, See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. God again foretells of a new thing, the coming of a servant who, when he comes, will set all things right. And so even many hundred years after God declares those words, one dark night on a hillside just outside of Bethlehem, to a band of sleepy shepherds, an angel of the Lord appears and says, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Behold. Now, behold's an interesting word. Like, when's the last time you used the word behold? Like, have you ever walked into your house with your family and said, Behold, daddy is home. Or behold, I've got some good news for you. Behold, I bring a gift. You've probably never done that. We don't really use that word. It's kind of one of those archaic words. And, and even in our key verse here, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it's a verse that, that is hidden with an exclamation mark. Um, and so we're told that the old has passed and the new is here, exclamation mark. But what it literally says in the Greek is it says, behold, the old has passed, the new is here. Now that word behold is a unique word. It's only used in the Bible to announce an unusually spectacular moment, something unique and incredible. Behold, the old is past, the new is here. And so those angels to those shepherds 2,000 years ago proclaimed, behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. And what is this spectacular moment that these angels are announcing while well, they continue. For unto you is born today in the city of David a Savior. He is Christ the Lord. Behold, a baby has been born for you. He's not just any baby. This baby, this little boy is Christ, which literally means the Messiah, the anointed promised one that God had spoke of many times over the millennia that he would send. He is here, this Christ. But he's not just the Christ. It's better than that. This Christ is the Lord. Now that's pretty incredible. What does that mean, that, that this baby is the Lord? Well, we've already heard that this angel who declares this is called an angel of the Lord. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And he said, the angel said, this child is the Lord. Just think of that. This angel belongs to this child. The glory that surrounded them was the glory of this child, Jesus. And, and what we understand is this incredible reality that this little boy is none other than God taking on flesh. Help from the outside. God has broken into the darkness of our world and light has dawned. Or as Paul put it in Philippians chapter two, verse six and seven, you'll see the words on your screen there. In, in speaking of Jesus, Jesus who in being very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And so what he's saying is that Jesus is none other than creator God who in taking on, on, on flesh kind of let go of all the advantages of his godness and left all his glory in heaven and all that worship and he entered into creation as a human being for us to save us. He came to do away with the old, to bring in the new and with his birth came the dawning of a new creation in Jesus, a life-transforming reality has invaded this age. That's what's happening at Christmas. The old is passing away and something new is arriving. Jesus was born to make you new. Now, what does that mean? In what way are we in Christ a new creation. I just, I just kind of want to paint a picture of, of what that means. 
in a few different ways, in ways in which in Christ we are made new. In Christ, first of all, we have a new relationship with God in that God relates to us in a brand new way. In fact, if you go back to our key verse there, uh, which was verse 17, if you continue in verse 18, it, uh, Paul goes on, he says, all this is from God who reconciled to us himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. So what is God doing in Christ? He, he is reconciling us to himself. He's doing away with everything that separated us from him. He is forgiving our sin in Jesus. Why? Well, because in verse 21 it, said God, it says, God made him Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus has come to, to pay our debt, to carry the burden of our sin to that cross. And Jesus, the only perfect one, satisfies all that we could not do so that we might become what he is, what he has, the righteousness of God, that we might have right standing with God. In Jesus, we are brought into a favored position with God. We receive forgiveness and fellowship again with him, a restored, reconciled relationship, a total makeover is what Jesus brings to us. No longer do we have to live in fear, wondering whether we have done enough or whether we could ever do enough to be acceptable to God because we are not acceptable to God. It's not determined by our works, but the works of Jesus done for us that we receive by faith in him. No longer do we have to live in fear of whether we've done enough. We don't have to live in, in the uncertainty of whether the things we face, the hard things we face, are God's punishment on us for something that we have done. We don't have to worry about that anymore. We don't have to carry our guilt. We can know that we have fellowship and favor with God through Jesus. We've got this new reconciled relationship with God. But that also brings new power. In Christ we receive new power to live a changed life. Now, now you might understand in, in hearing that we have like kind of a, a reconciled relationship with God for that to mean, well we've got like a fresh start. Like we've got a do over and God says, you got a clean slate, do better buddy, but, but that's not it at all because not only do we have a reconciled relationship with God, but in Christ we are given new power, the power of God at work in our lives that brings about change. We have a new power source. And, G and uh, Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter two, verses 12 and 13, when he says this. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling or with reverence for God, for, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in, a, uh, in order to fulfill his good purpose. He says, work out your salvation, work, but know this, even as you work, it is actually God working inside of you to bring about the change that he's calling you to. When we put our faith in Jesus, when we are in him, the Bible tells us that God makes his spirit to dwell within us, and it's that spirit that begins to work in our lives to bring about the change that we could not bring about in our own strength. We've got God's spirit at work in us. 
to bring about God's good purposes. And so Paul will say this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. He says, the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled, unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, we are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Do you hear that? We now in Christ are being transformed more and more into his image. The image that he created us to bear. Fellowship with him. And how are we, we being transformed more and more? Are we becoming like that, the image of God? Well, it's his spirit that dwells within us that is empowering that change. And I just find that so encouraging Christians, and I want you to be encouraged by that. What this means is we're not doing it on our own. We don't have to do it on our own. In Christ, we have new power, the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our life. So when we live by faith, when we obey, God is at work to bring about change by his power, by his power in Christ. We are a new creation. And what does that spirit work in our life? Well, thirdly, in Christ, we have new affections, new affections, um, new desires. Our desires more and more become God's desires. God's spirit births within us kind of these new affections, these new loves, and Paul talks about this in Romans chapter eight, verses 14 and 15, when he says those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God, and the spirit you received, Christians, does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him, that is by the spirit, we cry, Abba, Abba, Father. Now that word Abba is just uh, the, the word back in Jesus' day that a, a young child would cry out, a, a word of, of, of love and affection for one's, for one's father, Abba. And so by God's spirit now, we, we, we cry out to God, Abba. We have this new affection for God, for the things of God, and we find our desires being changed, that we are being weaned off of love for self, which brings slavery, love of stuff, which never satisfies, and more and more our affections are towards God and his ways and his glory. And, and that spirit brings about these new affections in our life. We are a new creation. And that new affection, one last thing, brings a new attitude, new attitudes into our lives as Christians. And Paul talks about this in Ephesians 4, verses 20 to 24, when he says, uh, however, that is not the, the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. That is, those old desires, you had the old way that was deceitful. It, it promised so much and delivered so little. All it brought was emptiness. Now, you have been made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We have been created, Paul says, again, a new creation, a new self that God has given to us, which brings with it new attitudes, the same attitudes that Jesus had towards us. We can now truly love others unconditionally. It's not about what we can get from others. Now it's what we have to give. We are empowered to truly love, to truly forgive, to truly live in peace with others. Jesus transforms our relationships with these new attitudes that are given to us in Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit within us. If anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. 
Christmas is about creation. Christ came that we might have a new relationship with God who gives new power, which causes new affections, which leads to new attitudes, a new you. That's why Jesus came. That's what Christmas is all about. A new you, behold. The old has gone. A new has come. I just want to close, well, I guess, with a question to, to two different groups of people that, that may be watching this right now. Uh, you know, the very first word in that key verse, 2 uh, Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. If. That's the one condition here. If. That tells us that there are two groups of people. There are are those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. So, which begs the question, what does it mean to be in Christ? If to be this new creation, you, you, you need to be in, like, in Christ, what does that mean? Well, simply put, it means to make a decision. It means to, to, to make a decision to choose to trust in Jesus. That's it. That's what it means to be in Christ, to choose to trust in Jesus. Jesus said, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever believes, that is, not just believes something that's true, some fact, but whoever trusts in Jesus, that person is made new. That's it. To choose to trust, not in oneself, not in one's own way, but to trust in Jesus and what he has done for you through his death on the cross to bring you into relationship with God. So some of you, I wonder, listening right now, maybe that's a choice you've never made. You know, maybe you're still kind of living astray and you feel that and you feel like you're kind of dwelling in darkness, experiencing emptiness, full of uncertainty about life, what it's all about, what the future holds. The good news is, is even today, even right now, you can choose to trust in Jesus and Jesus will make you new and that's why he came. That's what Christmas is all about. All you have to do is believe in him. Make that choice to trust and how do you do that? Maybe you wanna do that right now if you've never done that. What you'll see on your screen is a prayer. These aren't magic words, but these are words that if you pray them from your heart to God, are a way of choosing to trust in him, to turn from your way to his way. Jesus, I've gone astray living my own way. Thank you that you have done everything necessary to make a way for me back into relationship with God. Please forgive my sin and help me to live life your way. I give myself to you and choose to trust in you as my Lord Amen. Um, if you never prayed that prayer before and you feel like you're just living astray, I, I would just invite you to talk with God right now and maybe you want to use these words and choose right now to trust in him to receive the gift of a new life. I just want to leave you a moment to do that. If that's a choice you want to make right now, just go ahead, read those words, pray those words. If you would just want to pause so that they'll stay on your screen a little bit longer, you're welcome to do that. Hey, but friend, if, if that's a prayer that you prayed, <laughs> you know, if you've chosen to put your trust in Jesus um, to start a new life, I just would invite you to, to send us a message here at the church, you know, to me, to one of us pastors, to connect with us in some, some way, send us an email. 
And let us know because we'd just love to come alongside you and, and help you grow in a new relationship with God to live this new life. There's nothing better. You know, and for all of us who have chosen to put our trust in Jesus, you know, maybe that was, maybe it was decades ago. You know, maybe that was just months ago that you made that choice, you believed in him. Um, I got a question for you that you'll see on the screen now. Question is this, what new has God been doing in your life since you've been in Christ? God has made you a new creation. I just want you to, to, to look at that. We just ponder those words. What new has God been doing in you since you've been in Christ? Reflect on that. And, uh, you know, maybe something comes to mind, some change that God has brought in your, into your life. And uh, as you reflect on that, maybe just take a moment and, in, in prayer to God, thank Him. Thank Him for this new life that he has given you, the changes he has made in your life, this new creation that he has worked in you. Just take a moment to, to reflect and to pray. God, we're so grateful that Christmas is about more than gifts and it's about more than festivities. It's more than about family. All oh, would we love to be with our families this Christmas? And we're sad that we can't be God. And I know that people right now, um, Lord, we're just, we're experiencing a whole host of hardships Lord, many of them are just related to the situation we find ourselves in with this pandemic and being in a lockdown. Lord, there are some in our body right now that have lost fathers this week that are losing parents that they can't even visit. They're struggling in a whole host of ways. God, we just thank you that Christmas is about so much more than just the gifts and, and, and the family and the good things of this life. It's about a new life that you give us that nothing in this life can ever take from us. It's about a baby born, yes, but it's so much more than just about a baby. It's about your story of redemption from beginning to end, what you have been doing throughout history and have brought to fulfillment in your son Jesus. How you have been bringing about a new way, a new relationship with you. God, we just thank you for that life that we find in your son and just pray that you would renew that life in us today. And this week, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. New creations in Christ. Let's declare this song together, church. Jesus died for me. 
Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. Sunsets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Sunsets free, always free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Church, as we leave from this place of worship, let's say these words together. As we've said so many times, declaring who we are in Christ and as the body of Christ. We are the church. So wherever you go, Christ goes. If someone asks, what is your church like? Tell them, I am what my church is like. If someone asks, what does your church do? Tell them, I am doing what my church does. We are the church. And we may be the only contact someone has with Jesus this week. So they may not, so though they may not yet belong to his church, we can bring the church to them.